Um, so some of the things that we'll talk about, we'll recover some of these ideas, I think, um, which deal with what we call in the academic term as imaginaries. Um, and I'll scamper through, but I have to create credit to a whole bunch of people. Most of what we do in academia is based on a whole community of designers, researchers, technicians, um, some social scientists who stop you doing things ethically, and then designers like you who say, no, it's okay, we'll do it. Keep listening to the ethicists, because they do know best. Um, so everything you see is based on these people. So there's a big turn social scientists are suggesting, and this is not a new turn, is that um, through the 20th century, we, it was largely governed by ideologies, and the shift from ideologies into imaginaries. Now, you and I probably were in London, probably share the concept that we know the world through imaginaries, not ideologies. And I'll try and unpack the two differences, because when we talk about economic imaginaries, then you get to see this point that Mark's making, is that there's a whole bunch of imaginaries, ways of knowing the world, but some of them are very, very, very dominant, and it leaves many of the people out of the way. So briefly, imaginaries uh, could be seen as a creative and symbolic dimension of the social world, a dimension through which human beings create their ways of living together and the ways of representing their collective life. So how did you get here today? I took the tube. I didn't even occur to me I could have taken a helicopter. Didn't, I actually didn't think I would have used Uber because I just know the world through an imaginary. So no way, an imaginary is constructed through knowing and sense-making in the world, but then also a backdrop of how it's structured. And I didn't even conceive of any other better way than public transport. Another way, imagine the patterned convocations of the social whole. These deep-seated modes of understanding provide largely pre-reflexive parameters. I didn't think. I just got the tube from Caledonian Road. There wasn't any other doubt. That was the way I know London, and it's my imaginary. Other people don't travel here today using the same imaginaries. Um, they're pre-reflexive, within which people imagine their social existence expressed, for example, in conceptions of the global, the national, the moral order of our time. Now, those have all been constructed, folks, just as Mark says. They're constructed through the end of the 20th century. I don't know, is anyone under the age of 19 in the room? So you're all 20th century kids. So you're all fucked. <laughs> you're all Heinz Beans kids. You're uh, um, Findus Fishfinger kids. You're VW kids. You are constructed... And the world that you know around you is not any, in any way actual. It's purely real based on these imaginaries. Some of you were born into better ways of knowing the world, others more problematic. But they are, they are constructed. I think the most important one, which is a too long a sentence, is that I'll read from here. They exist at different sites and scales of action, from individual agents to the world society. Without them, individuals cannot go on in the world. If you didn't have an imaginary, some way of making sense of getting to the coffee at the end of the morning or getting to the tube, you couldn't go on. So you have to make um, a whole bunch of things. You have to make selective observation about what is real and what is natural, um, a reliance on specific codes and programs, the way you use your Oyster card or you just put it on your Apple Pay, use of certain categories. You've had to make a whole bunch of things because you're forced into... Um, and this is Jessup, into sense and meaning making. You had to make some sense of the world from primary school all the way up to getting into the, in your mum and dad's car to mum and dad going to work or not going to work. But you're also at the back of that based on a, what they call a structured sense of the world. What is right, what is wrong. Now that could have come from religion, it could have come from a growing up through a Tory government or a Labour government and a whole bunch of things around it. But there's a bunch of rule bases which he calls structured complexity, how does London work? How does it organise itself? Is it just, is everything just owned by the royal family? I come from, I'm, I mean, tell them English, but living in Edinburgh, it's very different in a structured complexity when it's a world heritage site. And people change their behaviour because their sense and meaning making is fundamentally different when you just come for August. I mean, you don't come at any other time. We don't exist, do we? Outside the fringe. I'm just clarifying that. So it means people make sense of the world. Now, these are not ideologies. That's the big difference, that in the past, maybe the 20th century, we had ideologies. My parents still believe that the NHS, the state, will look after them. A bunch of us who grew up through the 70s, 80s, aren't sure nuclear is good, not after Chernobyl. And then there's a the next generation coming up who are really asking, who don't want to be pushed. They don't believe in VW adverts. They don't believe in Don Drapers. They just don't understand what we take for being part of an imaginary, a way of knowing the world. So whatever you do out of all of these talks today, try to know your imaginary, because no one in the room will have the same as you. 
And you have to take responsibility for second-guessing how you got to know the world and why you make certain decisions. And on the back of that, we're very interested now in um, something Patrick talked about, is distributed to decentralised imaginaries, because you're beginning to see some of the fabrics of a centralised governed state begin to fray because of lack of trust or lack of, um, lack of, lack of alignment, I suppose. And some of the projects I'm going to show you then are predicated on interrogating what it might be like to have artefacts or products or systems that provoke questions around these imaginaries. So everything I'm about to show you is a bunch of prototypes. Try to say, how does this argue or contest with your imaginary? How does it disrupt it? We use this, this PwC took this down in the end actually, but this is a continuum of what happened post Bitcoin, so 2017, where you really began to see, and you can't see at the back, but it's a journey through smart contracts. It's a journey when you change the representation of value from money into data, you get codes. And what can you do as those codes become empowered or empowered through, through um, things like Solidity, which Ethereum uses, what happens? And they move from, well, basically, a family member can send, member can send Bitcoin to another family, all the way through to self-driving vehicles, allow themselves to pay off their dues, all the way to entirely distributed autonomous societies, such as the People's Republic of Lewis, which want to break away, but they don't really want to break away. Very complicated imaginaries. So what do we do? Well, let's see if this plays. We do things such as Geocoin. We have a small application I can show you later, which works rather like Ethereum. And I've put a bunch of hotspots in cities, so this is Tel Aviv, we've been to Amsterdam, we've been all over, dropping smart contracts in the street and forcing people into changing their behaviour because the code changes their wallet. So as I move down this street, I'm tempted to move over the road because if I move into a green area or grab a green bubble, I can gain money. And you can see here this green area is where the smart contracts are adding value and if I hit the blues, they simply take away. Now, they're quite wicked smart contracts, actually, and this might suggest that what we've designed here is an imaginary around a shopping mall where people want to keep you. They incentivize. So it's quite crude um, Adam Smith economies, really, but we ask people to body storm this, not brainstorm it. Um, and it's a, it's a clue to what smart contracting can do. So these group of people were given Geocoin after to enter the street. Just before we used that version, we actually used Bitcoin. So this was literally Bitcoin scattered through Amsterdam. Excuse the old model. But what was fascinating in the group is because they had the power to rewrite the contracts overnight, they turned the simple rule base into something else. So here this is an individual. They're pretending that Amsterdam has given out 200,000 euros in an Amsterdam cryptocurrency, but they're going to use it for voting. So if you get some of your residents, if you walk into these areas, you're not being fined. You're actually voting for some capital projects for the local government. So the local government are now, you're literally taking your money. You can't take your money out of the system, but you're choosing to spend it on a playground or a school. So suddenly the community flipped what was quite an Adam Smith um, incentive-based model into participatory budgeting, simply because the representation of value is not money. The representation of value is the vote. And your ability to vote in situ, not in hypothesis. So if you want bicycle stands, this person just click the button and they can vote on it. And everyone else in the community can allocate funds to that project. Um, other areas that we're interested in is these things called um, um, marriages. You're all 20th century kids. You still believe that marriage is for life. I can't tell you it's not. One of you will die first. Get out of, the, get out of it. But you're all 20th century. You'll still have these romantic, nostalgic ideas of contracts. I mean, I don't know what to tell you how fucked you are. Um, this particular group then started to say, well, how might a contract be fairer? Why should it be so lopsided? Um, and they very, very simply used a smart contract that allowed myself and Mark, perhaps, to go to the pub. If we're in the pub, it would, the code would simply give birth to a new wallet. And the team programmed a new wallet. So the code in initiated a wallet. While we were in that space, the wallet was taking money from our own separate accounts with cybersecurity, and we would spend. And when we left the pub, it simply dissolved the wallet. Now, if Mark and I wanted to go to HSBC later, we're not married, we have no formal certification, and get a joint account, that's really hard. Because of the imaginaries that surround the way that you and I can exchange value. You don't own those imaginaries. Structure does. And whether you want to invest them or explore them, you're going to have to need to be more radical. So what we do is, we, we, this is um, 
uh, members from Tesco Bank. They're, as a challenger bank, they don't have cash points. They don't have, um, they have we have access, or they pay licenses to use cash points. They don't have branches, but they were very keen. So I won't play all of this, but we let them free. And it's quite quickly, if you play with the technology, you realize how you can reconstruct what we call in economic imaginaries, because you begin to look at the values that Patrick was looking at. This is it's looking at um, enacting a new cinema smart ticket. So this actually is a cinema. They're in a cinema here. There's a big movie. There's a couple of trailers, which are two green spots you can't see from a distance. And they're enacting a social practice. It looks as though they're just moving through the streets playing Pokemon. They're actually in their heads imagining an entirely different ecosystem. Now, my problem at an art college is I don't have many technologies like that. I still have art teachers using, me, using wood, metal, ceramics, and plastics. And we got to get creative, starting to think about the flow of value, because it's intrinsically data, toward new creative models. So we do that. We also do things such as this, very keen to understand how the representation of value changes and how it begins to adopt values. So this is Dutch Design Week a few years ago. We took 100 coffee cups along, and we put NFC chips in the bottom of them. Each NFC chip has a bank account, really simple. Either it's got credit or it doesn't. This coffee cup has no credit. I can't get a coffee. This one has no credit either. But if I put them together in close proximity, they both get credit. Very, very simple. They can take that off to, well, they can see, they can check on their bank account. They've each got a number. They can find out that number five has got credit, number six hasn't, and take it to the barista who we hired, a very exotic Dutch barista, and they can pay out and get coffee. But what you're seeing here is people who've never met before getting their coffee credit and heading off to the coffee. So we ask you, what is the currency? Because what's the value of the currency? The value of the currency of going to a conference is to confer. Most of these people don't want coffee, but they want to meet someone. You laid out a whole bunch of food and breakfast out there, and you hoped conversation would take place. When you've got 300 people, it's not so easy. Our Dutch, uh, we added value as well here. That's a 15-minute wait for our coffee, and there's free coffee next door. So people do like the friction, the social friction. It's no different to a pub. But by changing the representation of value, you couldn't quite see, but the, the cups are designed by Katie West, who's a Scottish designer. She did the ceramics for the, the Commonwealth Games. So some people just stole the coffee cups. <laughs> some people didn't drink coffee. Some people didn't want it. They, so they, what they do and what we do as humans and the representation of value needs to be explored further. So you get these fantastic, these kind of weird moments where people aren't sure what they're doing, but you're trying to disrupt the imaginary. Um, earlier in the... Uh, this is about four years ago, we hacked a DeLonghi coffee machine and gave it a Bitcoin wallet because it was, looked like the thing to do at the time. Um, what, what, I don't know, it cost a fortune. Um, what we did do is at this moment, you're seeing Rory, the developer, choose the type of coffee beans that the machine then has the propensity to buy. And he just sees a scumbag, he just chose cheap. But what he had was social, environmental and ethical options. He's now going to buy the coffee because he just wants coffee, right? But what's happened on that slide is the bot, if you like, has then taken everyone's votes, and because it has its own Bitcoin wallet, is now going off to buy socially responsible beans. So we assume that you don't make good decisions. We assume that you're 20th century kids, you're still looking for marriage, you're still looking for the car of your dreams, and you will buy the iPhone 20. You are fucked and we are fucked because you haven't a clue what you're doing. So why not ask the bot to ask, get you what you need, get you your coffee, but it will decide what objects it needs to buy in the interest of the collective, because we just don't trust you anymore, I'm afraid. Um, we extended that with the EU Policy Lab. They became very interested in this, um, and they asked um, us to introduce three prototypes for politicians who are really struggling to understand this decentralization um, distribution opportunity. So Gigbis One is a hairdryer. It has three buttons. The green is the go. You can get your hair dried. Um, but in this instance, a student has been up at three or four o'clock in the morning and he's simply buying cheap energy. So he's buying it straight from the grid, three or four o'clock in the morning. It's dirt cheap and he's going to sell it back to you at seven o'clock on a Friday night because you are 20th century kids and that's what you'll do. I mean, look at your hair. It's gorgeous. So you'll buy this and you'll pay over the, end, over the top for his energy. He won't pay for his energy and he'll just have to pay in time at getting up at three or four to trade it. 
But that's the imaginary he wants to work in. Decentralized, beginning to balance. It's good for you because he's balancing the grid. He's taking away the energy, storing it, and then pushing it back. Rather than this idea that at 8 o'clock, we all need more energy because we all want to watch EastEnders. The second one involves a robot, so it has a small algorithm on it, and it says you load it with the values. You all want eco-energy, but how long will you wait to get it? Our assumption is that you are prepared to wait. I'm mean, going to have a think about it. How long would you wait? You press the button, and you're guaranteed eco-energy. Will you wait two minutes? Would you mind waiting two minutes? Would you mind waiting 10 minutes for your hair to be dried if you knew it was coming from eco resources. So in this one, the robot simply says, I promise I'll give you eco-energy and I'll go off the grid and find it, but it might take me 10 minutes. Might take two minutes. Every other button that you 20th century kids have known works straight away. That's not sustainable. You, you can't keep pressing buttons hoping that they work. So let the bots come in and make that decision for you. The last one says we really don't trust this, so we're taking buttons away from you. The worst thing you can do is give humans buttons. They'll just press them. So in this one, there is no button. It simply turns on, it simply turns on whenever, and it lets you know whether the energy in the grid locally is enough to use, because it doesn't think you are in a position to make that informed decision. There's no demonstration that you make informed decisions around the environment. So in this one, poor old Sean waits, and he just waits. And he knows it. The machine knows it's good at blowing, drying hair. But what's slightly more important is the energy in the grid. So he just waits and waits. And eventually, it will alert him and say, now's a good time. I've stored it, and it's ready to go. So it depowers you entirely. So the last one I want to show is something we're doing live in um, Australia at the moment. So this is really back to basic smart contracting. But while the others are just one-off prototypes, um, this is live. And we're hoping Oxfam Australia adopt it. Simply put, I'm going to explain what a smart contract is. This is a pound, as you can see. Jonathan's my excellent assistant. It's gone into a, a little disk here. He's pressed a button that initiates a smart contract. If in five minutes there is an earthquake anywhere on the planet, if there is, then that cog will turn and it will give the money to Oxfam. If there isn't an earthquake in five minutes, the money will simply be returned to you. So what we're beginning to do is explore our hunch is that you've lost trust in people such as Oxfam. Haiti seemed to reveal that. And they're trying to find ways to reassure you. And we think that's in the context of triangulation. So as, um, as you saw, what happened there, people took their money back. What happens in the five minutes, once there is or hasn't been an earthquake, people end up giving it away anyway because they've had time to think. And we've just released, um, yeah, this little app. It's on iPhone and it's on... Android, and it allows people, we give them 10 Australian dollars, this is part of the research project, but allows them to build simple contracts. And the contract is me building an earthquake contract that I want the beneficiaries to be Oxfam in this case. I want a US geological survey to, to attest this. I want to find out what the Richter scale is it needs to be. They're going off all the time. It's quite astonishing how alive the planet is. But I set up those conditions for the continents and slowly, I feel a bit more involved in connected in terms of how the values of my money then flow toward an impact. Thanks very much. <laughs>